So welcome back to the next vodcast. I think this is mole vodcast number four on how to calculate something called empirical formulas. This was the last slide of the previous vodcast, and as you can see, calculating percent composition should have been an easy concept for you, but it was integral to learning this next step. Again, everything in chemistry is sequential, and you have to build on the basis of a strong foundation of prior knowledge. So if someone gives you the percent composition of a substance, you should be able to determine what we call its empirical formula. And the empirical formula is the smallest or simplest whole number ratio of all of the atoms of the elements in the compound. Let's take a look at an example of that. If you have the formula of salt, sodium chloride, then there's simply one sodium for every one chlorine atom. It's really ions, but close enough. And we don't write ones in chemistry. So salt is an example where its real formula in nature, NaCl, is the same as its empirical formula, NaCl. But benzene is an example of a compound that's organic, six carbons to six hydrogens. You can reduce down a six to six ratio to a one to one ratio. So while the molecular formula of benzene is C6, its empirical formula is simply CH. So that's what we're going to find. We're going to find the empirical formulas, which essentially is doing some math that you're able to do, some dividing and some ratios, to find what are these small whole numbers that go to the bottom right. What are the subscripts? Now, if I give you a percent composition of a compound, for example, here's a compound made of manganese, carbon, and oxygen. There are a set of rules that are listed both in your PowerPoint as well as at the top of at least one, possibly two, of your empirical formula worksheets. But what you get to assume is that you enter a fantasy world and you assume that you have 100 grams of this mystery compound. Now here are the rules, but for me to explain this process, it's much easier if I can go right to an example. And here's a flow chart for those of you that are more graphically or symbolically inclined to follow. But let's go back to that problem. If I have 100 grams of this compound, then 38.43% of 100 is 38.43 grams. Or if you have 16.80% of your compound is carbon, then duh, you got 16.80 grams of carbon. And you can make the same conclusion for oxygen. So the cool part for these problems is the instant that you see percent symbols, mentally or actually cross them off and substitute in the symbol grams. And from there, you will go to a skill you already know. You are going to change grams into moles. I hope you have a calculator because we've got a lot of calculations to do here. So here's a picture of how we went to the periodic table and we're taking that 38.43 grams of manganese and turning it into moles by multiplying by the correct conversion factor. In one mole of manganese there are 54.938 grams of manganese. I hope you're getting good and comfortable enough with this now to realize if you're given grams, just divide by the molar mass of the substance. And I'm trying to be good here, so I'm using all of the digits that I see for the molar mass of an element in grams on the periodic table. Now hang on to that number. Notice that we carried it out. Don't round that off to 0.7. Carry it out at least three, probably four digits, so 0.6995 moles of manganese. Now we'll do the same thing with the oxygen and the carbon. Here is the carbon being converted into moles. Here is the oxygen being converted into moles. And again, notice that for both of those values, we carried it out, <coughs> excuse me, to three digits off to the right of the decimal point. You'll see why here in just a moment. Now when you lay those three numbers next to each other, you go, huh? I don't know what to do with that. But people who are good at math might already see wow, I can see maybe that this number is about twice as big as that one, and maybe this one might be four times bigger, but the numbers are still kind of ugly. So what I tell my students is when the numbers are kind of ugly, pick the number that's the smallest. In this case, 0.6995. Divide all three or two, or sometimes there's four. Divide all of the numbers by whichever one is the smallest, and then the ratio will hopefully pop out at you. So here's our work. 
When I divide 1.339 moles of carbon by 0.6995, up rolls the number 2 in my calculator. When I repeat the process for the moles of oxygen, out pops the number 4. And of course, any number divided by itself is 1. Now I'll have to point out, because this slide doesn't show it, there probably wasn't a 2 in the calculator. In fact, if I do this right now and I go 1.339 divided by 0.6995, sitting in my calculator is 1.91. And that's close enough to call that 2 moles. Where if I go 2.798 divided by 0.6995, now I'm looking at one that's actually pretty much right on. It's 4. So sometimes what you'll see in your calculator is like 1.99 or 1.95. Call that 2. Or maybe that might have been 4.01 or 3.92. It's okay to call that 4. So at a certain point, it's reasonable to round off to the nearest whole number. And now you have the subscripts. These are the small numbers that will go to the bottom right of all of the compound symbols that are in the formula. So we have one manganese, two carbons, and four oxygens in this compound, which is, by the way, called manganese oxalate. So that's how you do an empirical formula. And this last rule won't really mean anything to you, so I'll explain that now with another example. But I do want you to find this worksheet that's calculating the simplest empirical formulas that's in your packet. Notice it's the one that has the rules up at the top, which is kind of why I skipped over the rules. And the answers are given in boxes that you can see right here. Most of these on this particular sheet are no problem to solve in the method that I just showed you. But there is one and I believe it's question number five at the bottom of that worksheet, that I'd like to go over with you now to show what will you do if when you do the dividing step, dividing by the smallest number in the set, you come up with numbers that are still kind of not so attractive. So first step is, if I have 72.4% of iron and 27.6% composition of oxygen, fantasy world, I have 100 grams, so just change the percent symbols into grams, either in your mind and on the paper. Then change grams into moles. Notice that I went and used the complete molar mass off the periodic table. I'm not rounding off here. I repeated the process with oxygen. Honestly though, we use oxygen so much and if you have 15.999 or if you use 16, it really won't make that much difference in the answer, but I was being good here. Okay, who's the smaller number? You're right. It's 1.296. So I divide that number by myself and I would by itself and I would get one. If I divide 1.725 by the smaller number, now I got a kind of a funky number. 1.33 is basically one and a third. You can't round that off to one. And the ratio, if you look at it, another way to think of it is that you can't have a third of an atom of oxygen. The ratio would be 1.33 oxygens for every one iron. So you can't have a third of an oxygen atom. But what you can do is just a little mathematical trick. Since we came up with a third, multiply both of the numbers by three, and then you'll pop out with your small whole number ratio. When I multiply one and a third by three, I get four. And this is the most common mistake. People forget to multiply the one iron by three also. So now I have my subscripts. Notice that we always write the metallic element first when we put down the formula of a compound. And the oxygen, the nonmetal, comes next. Fe3O4, one of the two forms of iron oxide. So that's how you cope when you do the dividing step if you come up with a fraction that's too big to be rounded. If you look in your packet and you find this empirical formula worksheet, you'll see that problem number one on the worksheet that has ovals for your answer, that's an example when you get done with the steps, you end up with a half in there. And I bet you can figure it out. If you have thirds, you're going to times it by three. If you end up with halves in the number, then you'll double everything. So Make a note by that one right now while you're thinking about it. As you go to solve this problem, you'll end up having to double to avoid getting the fraction. Okay, that's it. 
Our next skill that you'll be learning is called molecular formulas. If you can do empirical formulas, then you should be able to do molecular formulas quite easily because it's essentially exactly the same thing with an additional simple step of multiplying. Okay, so I will see you at the next podcast and talk to you soon. Take care.